The Tomb by H. P. Lovecraft Sedibus un saltern placidus in mortu requesim. Virgil In relating the circumstances which have led to my confinement within this refuge for the demented, I am aware that my present position will create a natural doubt of the authenticity of my narrative. It is an unfortunate fact that the bulk of humanity is too limited in its mental vision to weigh with patience and intelligence these isolated phenomena, seen and felt only by a psychologically sensitive few which lie outside its common experience. Men of broader intellect know that there is no sharp distinction betwixt the real and the unreal, that all things appear as they do only by virtue of the delicate individual physical and mental media through which we are made conscious of them. But the prosaic materialism of the majority condemns as madness the flashes of supersight which penetrate the common veil of obvious empiricism. My name is Gervais Dudley, and from earliest childhood I have been a dreamer and a visionary. Wealthy beyond the necessity of a commercial life, and temperamentally unfitted for the formal studies and social recreations of my acquaintances, I have dwelt ever in realms apart from the visible world, spending my youth and adolescence in ancient and little-known books, and in roaming the fields and groves of the region near my ancestral home. I do not think that what I read in these books or saw in these fields and groves was actually what other boys read and saw there, but of this I must say little, since detailed speech would but confirm those cruel slanders upon my intellect which I sometimes overhear from the whispers of the stealthy attendants around me. It is sufficient for me to relate events without analyzing causes. I have said that I dwelt apart from the visible world, but I have not said that I dwelt alone. There is no human creature may do for lacking the fellowship of the living. He invariably draws upon the companionship of things that are not or are no longer living. Close by my home there lies a singular wooded hollow, in whose twilight deeps I spent most of my time, reading, thinking, and dreaming. Down its moss-covered slopes my first steps of infancy were taken, and around its grotesquely gnarled oak trees my first fancies of boyhood were woven. Well did I come to know the presiding dryads of those trees, and often have I watched their wild dances and the struggling beams of waning moon. But of these things I must not now speak. I will tell only of the lone tomb in the darkest of the hillside thickets, the deserted tomb of the Hydes, an old and exalted family whose last direct descendant had been laid within its black recesses many decades before my birth. The vault to which I refer is an ancient granite, weathered and discolored by the mists of dampness of generations. Excavated back into the hillside, the structure is visible only at the entrance. The door, a ponderous and forbidding slab of stone, hangs upon rusted iron hinges and is fastened ajar in a queerly sinister way by means of heavy iron chains and padlocks according to a gruesome fashion of a half a century ago. The abode of race whose scions are inured had once crowned the declivity which holds the tomb but had long since fallen victim to the flames which sprang up from a disastrous stroke of lightning. Of the midnight storm which destroyed this gloomy mansion, the older inhabitants of the region sometimes speak in hushed and uneasy voices, alluding to what they call divine wrath, in a manner that in later years vaguely increased the always strong fascination which I felt for the forest-darkened sepulchre. One man only had perished in the fire. When the last of the Hydes were buried in this place of shade and stillness, the sad urn full of ashes had come from a distant land, to which the family had repaired when the mansion burned down. No one remains to lay flowers before the granite portal, and few care to brave the depressing shadows which seem to linger strangely about the water-worn stones. I shall never forget the afternoon when I first stumbled upon the half-hidden house of the dead. 
It was in midsummer when the alchemy of nature transmutes the sylvan landscape into one vivid and almost homogeneous mass of green, when the senses are well nigh intoxicated with the surging seas of moist verdure and the subtly indefinable odors of the soil and vegetation. In such surroundings the mind loses its perspective. Time and space become trivial and unreal and echoes of a forgotten prehistoric past beat incessantly upon enthralled consciousness. All day I had been wandering through the mystic groves of the hollow, thinking thoughts I need not discuss, and conversing with things I need not name. In years a child of ten I had seen and heard many wonders unknown to the throng, and was oddly aged in certain respects. When upon forcing my way between two savage clumps of briars, I suddenly encountered the entrance to the vault. I had no knowledge of what I had discovered. The dark blocks of granite, the door so curiously ajar, and the funereal carvings above the arch aroused in me no associations of mournful or terrible character. Of graves and tombs I knew and imagined much, but had, on account of my peculiar temperament, been kept from all personal contact with churchyards and cemeteries. The strange stone house on the woodland slope was to me only a source of interest and speculation, and its cold, damp interior into which I vainly peered through the aperture so tantalizingly left contained for me no hint of death or decay. But in that instant of curiosity was born the madly unreasoning desire which has brought me to this hell of confinement. Spurred on by a voice which must have come from the hideous soul of the forest, I resolved to enter the beckoning gloom, in spite of the ponderous chains which barred my passage. In the waning light of day I alternately rattled the rusty impediments with a view to throwing wide the stone door, and essayed to squeeze my slight form through the space already provided, but neither plan met with success. At first curious, I was not frantic and when in the thickening twilight I returned to my home, I had sworn to the hundred gods of the grove that at any cost I would some day force an entrance into the black, chilly depths that seemed calling out to me. The physician with the iron-gray beard who comes each day to my room once told a visitor that this decision marked the beginnings of a pitiful monomania, but I will leave final judgment to my readers when they shall have learnt all. The months following my discovery were spent in futile attempts to force the complicated padlock of the slightly open vault, and in carefully guarded inquiries regarding the nature and history of the structure. With the traditionally receptive ears of a small boy, I learned much, although an habitual secretiveness caused me to tell no one of my information or my resolve. It is perhaps worth mentioning that I was not at all surprised or terrified on learning of the nature of the vault. My rather original ideas regarding life and death had caused me to associate the cold clay with the breathing body in a vague fashion, and I felt that the great sinister family of the burned-down mansion was in some way represented within the stone space I sought to explore. Mumbled tales of the weird rites and godless revels of bygone years in the ancient hall gave me a new and potent interest in the tomb before whose door I would sit for hours at a time each day. Once I thrust the candle within the nearly closed entrance, but could see nothing save a flight of damp stone steps leading downward. The odor of the place repelled yet bewitched me. I felt I had known it before, in a past remote beyond all recollection, beyond even my tendency of the body I now possess. The year after I first beheld the tomb, I stumbled upon a worm-eaten translation of Plutarch's lives in the book-filled attic of my home. Reading the life of Theseus, I was much impressed by that passage telling of the great stone beneath which the boyish hero was to find his tokens of destiny whenever he should become old enough to lift its enormous weight. This legend had the effect of dispelling my keenest impatience to enter the vault, for it made me feel that the time was not yet ripe. Later I told myself I should grow to a strength and ingenuity which might enable me to unfasten the heavily chained door with ease, but until then I would do better by conforming to what seemed to be the will of fate. Accordingly, my watches by the dank portal became less persistent, 
and much of my time was spent in other though equally strange pursuits. I would sometimes rise very quietly in the night, stealing out to walk in those churchyards and places of burial from which I had been kept by my parents. What I did there I may not say, for I am not now sure of the reality of certain things, but I know that on the day after such a nocturnal ramble I would often astonish those about me with my knowledge of topics almost forgotten for many generations. It was after a night like that that I shocked the community with a queer conceit about the burial of the rich and celebrated Squire Brewster, a maker of local history who was interred in 1711, and whose slate headstone, bearing a graven skull and crossbones, was slowly crumbling into powder. In a moment of childish imagination, I vowed not only that the undertaker, Goodman Simpson, had stolen the silver buckled shoes, silken hose, and satin small clothes of the deceased before burial, but that the squire himself, not fully inanimate, had turned twice in his mound cover coffin on the day of interment. But the idea of entering the tomb never left my thoughts, being indeed stimulated by the unexpected genealogical discover that my own maternal ancestry possessed at least a slight link with the supposedly extinct family of the Hydes. Last of my paternal race, I was likewise the last of this older and more mysterious line. I began to feel that the tomb was mine, and to look forward with hot eagerness to the time when I might pass within the stone door and down those slimy stone steps in the dark. I now formed the habit of listening very intently at the slightly open portal, choosing my favorite hours of midnight stillness for the hot vigil. By the time I came of age, I had made a small clearing in the thicket before the mold-stained façade of the hillside, allowing the surrounding vegetation to encircle and overhang the space like the walls and roof of Sylvan Bower. This bower was my temple, the fastened door my shrine, and here I would lie outstretched on the mossy ground thinking strange thoughts and dreaming of strange dreams. The night of the first revelation was a sultry one. I must have fallen asleep from fatigue, for it was with a distinct sense of awakening that I heard the voices of those tones and accents I hesitate to speak, of their quality I will not speak, but I may say that they presented certain uncanny differences in vocabulary, pronunciation, and mode of utterance. Every shade of the New England dialect, from the uncouth syllables of the Puritan colonists to the precise rhetoric of fifty years ago, seemed represented in that shadowy colloquy though it was only later that I noticed the fact. At any time, indeed, my attention was distracted from this matter by another phenomenon, a phenomenon so fleeting that I could not take oath upon its reality. I barely fancied, as I awoke, a light had been hurriedly extinguished within the sunken sepulchre. I do not think I was either astounded or panic-stricken, but I know that I was greatly and permanently changed that night. Upon returning home, I went with much directness to a rotting chest in the attic, wherein I found the key, which next day unlocked with ease the barrier I had so long stormed in vain. It was in the soft glow of late afternoon when I first entered the vault on the abandoned slope. A spell was upon me, and my heart leapt with an exultation I can but ill describe. As I closed the door behind me, and descended the dripping steps by the light of my lone candle, I seemed to know the way. And though the candle sputtered with the stifling reek of the place, I felt singularly at home in the musty charnel house air. Looking about me, I beheld many marble slabs bearing coffins or the remains of coffins. Some of these were sealed and intact, but others had nearly vanished leaving the silver handles and plates isolated amidst certain curious leaps of whitish dust. Upon one plate I read the name of Sir Geoffrey Hyde, who had come from Sussex in 1640 and died here a few years later. In a conspicuous alcove was one fairly well-preserved and untenanted casket, adorned with a single name which brought to me both a smile and a shudder. An odd impulse caused me to climb upon the broad slab, extinguish my candle, and lie down within the vacant box. In the gray light of dawn, I staggered from the vault and locked the chain of the door behind me. I was no longer a young man, though but twenty-one winters had chilled my bodily frame. 
Early rising villagers who had observed my homeward progress looked at me strangely, and marvelled at the signs of ribald revelry which they saw in one whose life was known to be sober and solitary. I did not appear before my parents until after a long and refreshing sleep. Henceforth I haunted the tomb each night, seeing, hearing, and doing things I must never reveal. My speech, always susceptible to environmental influences, was the first thing to succumb to the change, and my suddenly acquired archaism of diction was soon remarked upon. Later a queer boldness and recklessness came into my demeanor, till I unconsciously grew to possess the bearing of a man of the world, despite my lifelong seclusion. My formerly silent tongue waxed vocal with the easy grace of a Chesterfield or the godless cynicism of a Rochester. I displayed a particular erudition, utterly unlike the fantastic monkish lore over which I had pored in youth, and covered the fly-leaves of my books with facile impromptu epigrams which brought up suggestions of gay prior and the sprightliest of Augustan wits and rhymesters. One morning at breakfast I came close to disaster by declaiming in palpably licorice accents an effusion of eighteenth-century bacchanalian mirth. A bit of Georgian playfulness, never recorded in a book, which ran in something like this. Come hither, my lads, with your tankers of ale, and drink to the present before it shall fail. Pile each on your platter a mountain of beef, for tis eating and drinking that bring us relief. So fill up your glass, so life will soon pass. When you're dead, ye'll ne'er drink to your king or your lass. An Akron had a red rose, so they say. But what's a red rose if you're happy and gay? Gad split me, I'd rather be red whilst I'm here than white as a lily and dead half a year. So Betty, my miss, come give me a kiss. In hell there's no innkeeper's daughter like this. Young Harry, propped up as straight as he's able, will soon lose his wig and slip under the table. But fill up your goblets and pass them around better under the table than under the ground. So revel and chaff, as ye thirstily quaff, under six feet of dirt, tis less easy to laugh. The fiends strike me blue, I'm scarce able to walk, and damn me if I can stand upright or talk. Here landlord bid Betty to summon a chair, I'll try home for a while, for my wife is not there. So lend me a hand, I'm not able to stand, but I'm gay whilst I linger on top of the land. About this time I conceive my present fear of fire and thunderstorms, Previously indifferent to such things, I had now an unspeakable horror of them, and I would retire to the innermost recesses of the house whenever the heavens threatened an electrical display. A favorite haunt of mine during the day was a ruined cellar in the mansion that had burned down, and in fancy I would picture the structure as it had been in its prime. On one occasion I startled a villager by leading him confidently to the shallow sub-cellar, of whose existence I seemed to know in spite of the fact that it had been unseen and forgotten for many generations. At last came that which I had long feared. My parents, alarmed at the altered manner and appearance of their only son, commenced to exert over my movements a kindly espionage which threatened to result in disaster. I had told no one of my visits to the tomb, having guarded my secret purpose with religious zeal since childhood. But now I was forced to excise care in threading the mazes of the wooded hollow, that I might throw off a possible pursuer. My key to the vault I kept suspended from a cord about my neck, its presence known only to me. I never carried out of the sepulchre any of the things I came upon whilst within its walls. One morning, as I emerged from the damp tomb and fastened the chain of the portal with no too steady hand, I beheld an adjacent thicket the dreaded face of a watcher. Surely the end was near, for my bower was discovered, and the objective of my nocturnal journeys revealed. The man did not accost me, so I hastened home in an effort to overhear what he might report to my careworn father. Were my sojourns beyond the chain door about to be proclaimed to the world? Imagine my delighted astonishment on hearing the spy inform my parrot in cautious whisper that I had spent the night in the bower outside the tomb. My sleep-filmed eyes fixed upon the crevice where the padlocked portal stood ajar. By what miracle had the watcher thus been deluded? 
I was now convinced that a supernatural agency protected me. Made bold by this heaven sent circumstance, I began to assume perfect openness in going to the vault, confident that no one could witness my entrance. For a week I tasted to the full the joys of that charnel conviviality which I must not describe, when the thing happened, and I was borne away to this accursed abode of sorrow and monotony. I should not have ventured out that night, for the taint of thunder was in the clouds, and the hellish phosphorescence rose from the rank swamp at the bottom of the hollow. The call of the dead, too, was different. Instead of the hillside tomb, it was the charred cellar on the crest of the slope whose presiding demon beckoned me with unseen fingers. As I emerged from an intervening grove upon the plain before the ruin, I beheld in the misty moonlight a thing I had always vaguely expected. The mansion, gone for a century, once more reared its stately height to the raptured vision, every window ablaze with the splendor of many candles. Up along the drive rolled the coaches of the Boston gentry, whilst on foot came a numerous assemblage of powdered exquisites from the neighboring mansions. With this throng I mingled, though I knew I belonged with the hosts rather than the guests. Inside the hall were music, laughter, and wine on every hand. Several faces I recognized, although I should have known them better had they been shriveled or eaten away by death and decomposition. Amidst a wild and reckless throng, I was the wildest and most abandoned. Gay blasphemy poured in torrents from my lips, and in my shocking sallies I heeded no law of God, man, or nature. Suddenly, a peal of thunder, resonant even above the din of the swinish revelry, clave the very roof and laid a hush of fear upon the boisterous company. Red tongues of flame and searing gusts of heat engulfed the house, and the roisterers, struck with terror at the descent of a calamity which seemed to transcend the bounds of unguided nature, fled streaking into the night. I alone remained, riveted to my seat by a groveling fear which I had never felt before. And then a second horror took possession of my soul. Burnt alive to ashes, my body dispersed by the four winds, I might never lie in the tomb of Hyde's. Was not my coffin prepared for me? Had I not a right to rest until eternity among the descendants of Sir Geoffrey Hyde? I, I would claim my heritage of death, even though my soul goes seeking through the ages for another corporeal tenement to represent it. On that vacant slab in the alcove of the vault, Gervais Hyde would never share the sad fate of Polinarus. As the phantom of the burning house faded, I found myself screaming and struggling madly in the arms of two men, one of whom was the spy who had followed me to the tomb. Rain was pouring down in torrents, and upon the southern horizon were flashes of the lightning that had so lately passed over our heads. My father, his face lined with sorrow, stood by as I shouted my demands to be laid within the tomb frequently admonishing my captors to treat me as gently as they could. A blackened circle on the floor of the ruined cellar told of a violent stroke from the heavens, and from this spot a group of curious villagers with lanterns were prying a small box of antique workmanship which the thunderbolt had brought to light. Ceasing my futile and now objectless writhing, I watched the spectators as they viewed the treasure trove, and was permitted to share of their discoveries. The box, whose fastenings were broken by the stroke which had unearthed it, contained many papers and objects of value, but I had eyes for one thing alone. It was the porcelain miniature of a young man in a smartly curled bag wig, and bore the initials J.H. The face was such that as I gazed I might well have been studying my mirror. On the following day I was brought to this room with the barred windows, but I had been kept in, informed of certain things through an aged and simple-minded servitor, for whom I bore a fondness in infancy, and who, like me, loves the churchyard. What I have dared to relate of my experiences within this vault has brought me only pitying smiles. My father, who visits me frequently, declares that at no time did I pass the chain portal, and swears that the rusted padlock had not been touched for fifty years when he examined it. 
He even says that all the village knew of my journeys to the tomb, and that I was often watched as I slept in the bower outside the grim façade, my half opened eyes fixed on the crevice that leads into the interior. Against these assertions I have no tangible proof to offer, since my key to the padlock was lost in the struggle on the night of horrors. The strange things of the past which I learnt during these nocturnal meetings with the dead, he dismisses as the fruits of my lifelong and omnivorous browsing among the ancient volumes of the family library. Had it not been for my old servant Hiram, I should have by this time become quite convinced of my madness. But Hiram, loyal to the last, has held faith in me, and has done that which impels me to make public at least part of my story. A week ago he burst open the lock which chains the door to the tomb perpetually ajar, and descended with a lantern into the murky depths. On a slab in an alcove he found an old but empty coffin, whose tarnished plate bears the single word Gervais. In that coffin, and in that vault, they have promised me I shall be buried. The End of the Tomb by H. P. Lovecraft